for this event. Um, and if you haven't already, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat um, and um, get to know people. And you know, I'm sure there are some folks that have met each other and some that haven't. This is a great opportunity to meet um, a ton of amazing people here in Chicago. So my name is Ella McCann and I am the Manager External Relations and Strategic Partnerships here at the Baumhart Center. And for those of you that may not know, the Baumhart Center is within the Quinlan School of Business at Loyola University Chicago. And we are preparing leaders to tackle society's most pressing challenges through education, engagement, and research. And we live at the intersections of profit and purpose. So I am thrilled to bring you this event today with a stellar group of leaders here in Chicago who are doing the same in their fields. The idea for this event came out of a couple of thoughts that all of us have probably been having, having for over the past couple of um, months over the pandemic, right? And so we have the idea of the great resignation, which is happening. Are employers prepared for it? Are they ready for um, finding out ways to support their staff so that they don't want to resign from the company? Or if they are, are they prepared to support them um, as they move on into their new roles or new positions or whatever it is that they choose to do? And then we also have, we've seen that women have been impacted by this um, more so than any demographic, right? And we've seen the numbers, um, almost 55% have left the workforce or have um, pivoted in their careers. And so what does the future of work look like for women? And what does it look like for employers to support um, women at work? Um, and, and how can we really make sure that we're holistically including all of our employees um, as we continue to do this work? in the midst of something that is just unprecedented um, for all of us. And so to get us started with this conversation um, and to give us some framing for it, we're gonna have Dr. Linda Tonke Zayer uh, to give us a breakdown of what's going on in the market, what trends we're seeing and how these trends are impacting the future of work. We will then go into a panel discussion with time for Q&A at the end. So Dr. Linda Tonke Zayer is a professor of marketing at the Quinlan School of Business and our newly appointed acting associate dean, congratulations. Her research explores gender, identity, branding, and consumer behavior with a focus on transformative consumer research and has been published in the top journals in the field, including the Journal of Consumer Research, the Journal of Retailing, and the Journal of Advertising. And as you can see, her presentation is up, so I will hand it over to Dr. Zayer to take us into our, the beginning of our um, presentation. Thank you so much, Ella, and thank you to the Baumhart Center for inviting me um, just to share a few of my thoughts before we um, go into what I um, think is going to be an amazing panel of um, women and a great discussion. So um, thank you again. My talk is partially inspired by a recent editorial in the Journal of um, Association for Consumer Research. Um, that I wrote with my co-editors, um, Catherine Coleman and Eileen Fisher. And um, I've done research in this area of gender markets for about 20 years, but this piece in particular was um, really focusing on how our once taken for granted um, institutions in society, uh, work, school, family, government have uh, significantly been disrupted due to the pandemic, as well as the heightened salience of systemic racism. So in that editorial, um, we talk about how we um, have really served to exacerbate existing inequalities um, across the globe, which were already very much deeply entrenched along um, gendered and racial and socioeconomic lines. Um, so we highlight the impact of access to um, market resources, the intertwined nature of labor, work life, personal life, and particularly fo focusing on this um, idea about the gendered nature of giving care and being cared for. Um, so uh, that was a little bit of the inspiration for today's talk. Um, and so, Today, in particular, I want to focus on, um, as Ella had mentioned, you know, experts across the country have been um, warning us for months about the Great Resignation. Um, a survey found that more than 40% of employees are considering leaving their current employer this year. Um, another survey came out just last week that showed actually it was upwards of 55% who anticipate looking for a new job. And the number one reason, even more than pay, was this idea about flexibility. 
Um, and it was particularly salient um, among millennial employees. So 78% of millennial employees said they would be interested in a job change. So today I wanna to discuss kind of at a macro level, some of the trends um, that uh, we're seeing in regards to future work in general, and then focus just a little bit of time on what I think is one of the most important issues, which is this idea about caregiving. So let's just start out with a very macro view um, of the idea that institutions around the world are really recognizing the role that they must play in addressing social outcomes. So um, the Business Roundtable recently stated that all stakeholders are essential to consider, right, when making a business decision. So the employees, the community, the environment, et cetera, in addition to um, shareholders, Organizations that serve higher education are also taking up the cause of social justice. Um, the United Nations has the principles for responsible management education, um, which are really pushing management education to be a force for good. Um, our accreditation bodies are recognizing these standards. Um, and of course, this is nothing new to Loyola. I'm happy to say our Jesuit, Jesuit values have always really um, you know, had this uh, have really embraced the idea of the whole person and our business education has always prioritized ethics. Um, so it's really an imperative for companies to be purpose driven. And we see among US-based employees, um, two thirds say that COVID has caused them to reflect on their purpose in life um, in general. And nearly half said that they're reconsidering the type of work that they do because of the pandemic. And again, millennials were more likely to reevaluate re work um, than others. So again, at a macro level, there is a shift in business as usual. So we can see that it is coming both, I think, from the top down, as well as what the we can see that the workforce is, is demanding it as well. So what are some of the trends that were going on? And, um, you know, uh, what, what can we look to in terms of, again, at that macro level? So I often look at uh, discourses or conversations that are happening in society to see how they both trickle down um, on a meso or micro level, and in turn, how that micro or individual level then shapes um, the meso and macro. Um, so these things are very iterative, keep that in mind. Um, so Mintel had a really nice um, report on the future of work, and they were talking about how some of the trends happening even in the, you know, before times um, have only just accelerated uh, really due to the pandemic. So um, I pulled some from there and I also added um, a few of my own. So one of the things that we see, of course, is technology and automation. So they've had both its benefits and its unintended consequences. So what I mean here is that, of course, it has allowed some portion of the workforce um, the privilege to work from home. However, we know that continued work from home can also have some downsides, um, such as not feeling as connected, not seen by senior management, um, lack of those informal conversations, uh, perhaps less in the know, um, feelings of isolation um, within the context of work. Relatedly, there um, was the trend of nomadic employees, uh, which is basically being able to do your job from anywhere in the world, right? Again, some of the same consequences potentially, um, but also the idea of increased competition really on a global scale now for, for the workforce. Um, the blur between work and personal life um, as the ideal worker mentality is still very much pervasive today. So this is the expectation that employees prioritize work over all other par parts of their lives. So there's a um, sociologist from IU that talks about um, the ideal worker and um, she describes it as the norm tells you that you have to be dedicated to your job 24 seven. You have to have your cell phone with you at all times. You have to be constantly available for email. You have to be ready to drop everything to finish that report. Essentially, you're supposed to be dedicating your whole life uh, to your work. So what we see is that there's some research um, indicating um, that this is actually intensified 
um, during the pandemic. Um, we see that highly educated and highly paid workers have been putting in more hours. Um, this is particularly salient in the US, which um, where we know people are spending more hours um, on work um, compared to other most uh, industrialized nations. So um, the pandemic has worsened this with Americans working at home, um, putting in an extra one to three hours per day of work. Um, that was last spring. So clearly I think trends happening before the pandemic of technology, nomadic employees, um, the ideal worker discourse has only intensified. Uh, interestingly though, we see kind of two camps with regard to work and identity. So for some folks, particularly in the older generation, your work is who you are. Um, and for others, there's an increasing separation of work and personal life. Um, they realize they're replaceable. They have no ties to their work beyond using it as a means to earn a living. Uh, the New York Times just last week had a very interesting article um, called, it was about the phenomenon of laying flat. Um, uh, so this is something that they were pointing to as emerging in China, which is the belief of a slow lifestyle in reaction to a hyper-competitive middle-class culture. And then lastly, there's, of course, the shifting gender norms and dynamics um, in uh, society, both in terms of women in the workforce and hopefully in leadership roles, um, more egalitarian household and parenting roles, um, the recognition of other family structures beyond just the heteronormative or two person, um, two, two parents. Um, again, though, an obvious tension here between the ideal of motherhood and the, and the ideal worker, for example. So unfortunately, while changing gender norms um, was um, really uh, getting what I think was, you know, maybe at a tipping point or gaining steam before COVID, um, I would say, um, obviously have suffered a lot of setbacks now um, from recent events. So again, there's, you know, many more issues than this, but one thing that I wanted to focus on um, was this idea about caretaking. So we saw the issue of caretaking really come to the forefront um, as it was intertwined with work. And um, we know, for example, one in five adults in the US are caretakers in two thirds of married couples with children, both individuals work. Um, nearly half of adults in their forties and fifties are in the sandwich generation. generation. Um, myself included, so caring for both children and parents at the same time. Uh, if we look at the American Time Use Survey, for example, we know parents spent an increasing amount of time caring for their kids within the last year, and it was mostly women um, that bared much of that burden, especially women with elementary school kids. So we see in that six to 12 your age range, um, women spent over eight hours a day in caretaking um, on average. So we can see um, in heterosexual partnerships with both parents working, mothers with children under 12 had reduced their um, paid working hours four to five times as much as fathers. And um, interestingly, what we see in the research is that in egalitarian divisions, um, of pandemic parenting were commonplace because what happened is that couples relied on these default gender stereotypes of men as the breadwinners and women as caregivers in justifying their choices, okay? And then I'm, of course, in higher education, so we have felt kind of unique dynamics um, with this. Um, scholars have highlighted the impact of the strain of caregiving in academia, for example, especially on women and women of color who are disproportionately um, take on the role of caregiver. Um, so we see things like research productivity plummeting, um, journal submissions, um, things like that. So um, all kinds of research outputs being impacted, particularly for women academics. So you can see, um, you know, the long-term <laughs> impacts, you know, coming down the pipeline um, for women in academia, 
um, for caretakers in general, but especially um, uh, women caretakers. So um, on the staff side in higher education, you also see a lot of times they have even less flexibility. Um, so, you know, there have been articles about, you know, will there be a mass exodus um, because of reduced flexibility? So really the question is, you know, what can be done to support caregivers? Um, because this trend is obviously most acutely felt because of the pandemic, um, but it will be a, a continued um, issue for sure. So we have seen an exodus of women from the workforce, one of the lowest rates of women's employment since the 1980s, um, an estimated $64 billion a year in lost wages and economic activity, um, less autonomy for women that come hand in hand with lost financial power, um, increasing work-life conflicts. So, you know, all of these issues kind of swirling around, which are vitally important for society, for business, um, for women's lives, for families. So um, I'm proud that we're taking time today to really talk about these issues with um, this brilliant lineup of, of women to ask, you know, where do we go from here? So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Zayer. That was an informative and engaging presentation. And the numbers are just 64 billion in lost wage. The numbers are just astounding. And so I think you pose the perfect question to lead us into our um, panel discussion. And we're gonna go ahead and, and spotlight um, all of our panelists and I will introduce them as we are um, going through that. So first we have Lourdes Gonzalez, Director, Global Employee Experience. Uh, spent the last two decades in the culture and EX space infusing humanity into work for big, medium and startup companies. And then we have uh, Carla Madeline Coop, CEO of the Impact Alliance, a diversity, equity, inclusion and anti-racism colonialism enterprise. She also serves as the gender and racial equity program director for the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. And she is chief strategy officer and managing partner of Ebony Law, a black owned and black led law firm here in uh, Chicago. We have Tiara Muse, vice president at Koya Partners, an executive search firm that is cultivating new leadership for a changing world. Tiara brings a broad range of search experience in the private private, nonprofit, and public sectors to her clients. She leverages her expertise in C-suite leadership to partner with clients and guide candidates as a member of Koya Partners and the Diversified Search Group's CEO practice. Tiara also advises clients seeking to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, we have our very own Nicole Johnson Scales, executive career strategist at her newly launched Design Your Professional Joy. Nicole leverages two decades of leadership experience to empower her clients to become high impact leaders within their industries, whether starting a new role or a position to take their leadership to the next level. Nicole helps leaders design a powerful strategy, leveraging their strengths and talents, building confidence and courage along the way. So as you can see, an amazing panel that we have here tonight today to share with you all about their experiences as well as what they're seeing um, in, their, in their fields and across Chicago um, with these uh, ideas of the future of work. So let's dive into these questions. Um, over the last year plus, we've seen women leaving the workforce. And Linda, Dr. Zayer just gave us a great presentation about those numbers and what we're seeing. But what does the future of work look like for women in your industries um, and to you all? And I'll, I'll start it with, uh, with Carla, um, if you wanna sort of lead us off. Um, Bote, as uh, we say in my parents' tribe in the Congo, this is how you address your village and your elders and uh, everybody around you. So uh, um, thanks so much for having me, um, Ella. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting, you know, this question always comes up, you know, and it, it always comes up in the, in, the, um, in the context of, you know, how can we support, you know, let's say caregivers or, or women and so forth. Um, but I'd like to ask the question actually differently. Um, my question would be, what do employers have to do now, right? I, I think, um, as I've been telling my clients and, and others, you know, it's a brand new day. Um, you know, women are resigning for, for several reasons, right? And I think, um, just as, you know, um, this pandemic has been a reset button globally, you know, here in this country for us, ourselves as individuals, but also as professionals, 
the question is, well, how am I going to, you know, continue life? How am I going to continue to craft my career? And so, you know, when with this whole talk about coming back to the office, you know, for a lot of us, including, you know, women who identify as me, as Black, as, as BIPOC, um, and, and otherwise historically um, or systemically marginalized or underrepresented, it's, well, why, what, why would I go back, right? Because things have not been great be before uh, the impact of the pandemic, you know, and now where we all had to pivot, where we all had to kind of reimagine, um, you know, what it means to work or how we work, um, you know, the question is, why, why would I go back? And so it has to really be, you know, I think, yes, obviously you see kind of more what we see more prevalent in the younger um, uh, you know, generations coming into the workforce saying, I want, to, I want to not just work to make my living or earn my living, but I want it to matter. I want it to connect and resonate and be aligned with who I am and my values and so forth. But you know, I think you know, when, uh, when, when, when Dr. Zaya um, was talking in terms of you know, being in person, what were the main reasons for that, right? Being seen, having access, um, but a, a lot of us were still invisible. A lot of us were still, you know, without power, without authority, without voice. So a lot of us had this, you know, at this moment asking ourselves, well, why would I go back to that if I can, you know, now that I've experienced a year and a half of being at home, being able to do my job, really trying to see where I want to go from here, you know, that's, that's what the calculus is about now. And really it's up to the employers now to prove, you no, know, when you come back, things will be different, right? And so the onus should be on the employers, not on us in the workforce joining or coming back or going somewhere else, yeah. right? So yeah. I think to, to be in this moment, it's a very exciting moment. And um, so I'm hoping that we get to shift the way we frame this conversation and how we see workforce and employer or employee and em employer relations um, going forward. So it's kind of like, my opening and, and grand statement, uh, but I'd love to hear what my, my fellow queens and goddesses have to say as well. Yeah, and if anyone wants to, to join in, I will just say, I, I love how you reframed the question um, that it is on employers at this point. How are you supporting your staff um, in all capacities, especially as we go into this sort of transition mode? Um, and if you're calling for them to return to office, what are you providing that they can't get um, from their own spaces. And I know Lourdes, you can you can talk to that, especially um, with how companies can have a more holistic view of, of their employees and um, an inclusive workplace and workspace. Absolutely. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you everybody for being here today. It's a collective effort. It's going, there's no playbook for this. So it's going to take all of us coming together, raising our hand and saying, if you're asking me to go to the office, what for? Is it for social connections? Is it for the moments that matter? Like what really makes a difference? That's one piece. And then the second piece is for employers to start rethinking the employee experience, meaning are you crafting roles and programs that appeal to my sense of purpose, that appeal to my different identities? Like, you know, today, intentionally, I'm wearing this t-shirt. I, I wish all employees would show up saying, hey, here are my different identities. I'm a woman, I'm Latina, I may be a caregiver. Uh, so it's how you listen. So I'll say, Ella, two main things. One is how you plug in to listen in to employee sentiment, but it's not anymore about one to many, where we used to send out surveys that appeal to everybody, ask a few questions, be done. Now it's slicing it and dicing it by demographics. So what gender, age, and then getting that feedback and actually having conversations through focus, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interactions. So then we can truly design the flexibility needed for each person in crafting their roles and the experiences that really matter to them when it comes to work, as opposed to programs that used to be you know, one-to-many and that do not appeal to bringing our whole selves to work. Since uh, Dr. Zayer mentioned, now it's this blurred home and work life coming together. Yeah, and no, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. One more thing. I think um, as, as much as a lot of us have been banging the drum on this, but you know, pay, and I will say not just pay equality, but pay equity, right? I think especially not coming back um, you know, we're still kind of playing into the gender binary, right? We, we use the term care, caretaker, we say supporting them, but really what the last year and a half has shown is we all have been doing all things 
at all times and still producing, still, still, you know, um, meeting deadlines, still, um, you know, making it work regardless of how we identify as, as gender. Yes, the, the load has been more on us uh, who identify as women or who have been given the traditional role of, of care uh, giver and so forth. But I think what, what we need to understand now is that we have kind of proven that most of these stereotypes did not really apply in terms of, you know, what you, in the past used to be kind of the, the reasons for, for the pay gap, right? It's saying, well, women need flexibility because, you know, they're the ones bearing children and they're, they're the ones having to take care of their elderly parents and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yet you have women, you know, especially black women having the grease up the wazoo, you know, compared to their supervisors or to, to their bosses and yet still being paid less. Right. So I think part of this, this, whatever this next steps, these next steps are going to look like will have to be about pay transparency and really um, ju having to justify as, as an employer, why I still choose to, 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 com uh, to compensate you on a certain, in a certain way, in a certain level, even though you've proved me that you do just as good as a job as, as Ted, who identifies as man, as a man and is, is white and has less degrees or less experience or, or, or whatever, or have less education as you. Right. So I think we have to understand that this will be also part um, of the conversation going forward. And, and, and I think that's what a lot of people and especially the younger generations are not gonna let, out, let off on. I think that will be um, something that employers will have to be, um, you know, will, will now, not, now have to answer to, I think, um, from what I'm hearing and, and seeing as well. Nicole, you specifically help people um, with their future and what it looks like. So I wonder if you also have some insights into what the future of work looks like for women that you can share with us. Sure, and good good afternoon, everyone. And the wonderful thing about being on a panel with so many smart women is all I get to say is what she said, right? I can agree with what my <laughs> fellow panelists are saying because they're dropping gems. And the one thing that I'll, I'll add is the this conversation specifically resonates with me having been part of the great resignation, leaving my corporate job of many years at the end of April, because I had decided that I wanted something different. I wanted something more. What we recognize is that the workplace was created and designed for men, that the structure didn't work for women before the pandemic and it blew up during the pandemic. And how women define sex, success is often different than how men success than to, to define sex. So we tend to place high value on the quality of our lives at work and the impact of our, our contributions. And that doesn't mean that title and compensation are important. It just means that those things are likely not going to be enough. And so this moment in time gives us the opportunity to create the future of work by getting in the driver's seat of our careers. I agree with my fellow panelists, the employers have a responsibility, but I also feel that we were created with two legs and if we don't like it, we can walk. We've got the ability to get up, move to a place that values our contributions and the way in which we commit and show up every day. Dr. Yes. Linda said that 55% of, of employees are thinking about moving to the next role. I read a Forbes article, said, article that said within that 61% of women are planning a career move. 25% have already started thinking about creating their own business. So I just wanna remind everyone that we have the ability to proactively pursue the things that we want more authenticity, like Carla said, designing our lives in alignment with our values and our priorities, more impact so we get to decide the impact that we want to have on the world, more fulfillment to really ensure that our buckets are filled by our career and that our careers just aren't necessarily a source of what is draining our, our buckets and causing it to be empty. But what it takes, quite frankly, is us saying enough. Enough to the things that don't bring us joy, enough to work environments that don't support us, doing work that we don't love, enough. But I will offer that we've got to recognize that we have indeed the power to change all of these things, but what we have to do as women is to have the confidence in ourselves to create the change that we want to see. Mm. Mm. Couldn't have said it better myself. And and yeah, just thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Tiara, did you want to share? Yeah. All right. So thank you for having me as well. And that just following up to what Nicole just said, I'll put an exclamation point on it actually, um, which is truly around just showing up authentically, right? So we are literally at a point where we can transform spaces 
and places through that confidence that Nicole just articulated. So how are we showing up differently and redefining who we are in spaces, right? And then rethinking or retooling our own minds to, to really consider what is our work-life fulfillment, right? Not balance. Balance is almost difficult to mm. consume, but the fulfillment on both ends looks quite different than it did last year for many. And that fulfillment really does need to align with your personal as well as pro professional goals. So with that thought, we truly can show up and ask for things in a different way um, through policy also, which drives practice, holding people accountable for counteracting biases around our work and our contributions to organizations. So I really just wanna put an exclamation point on everything that each of you just share um, as it relates to how we authentically completely bring all of our different perspectives and hats and roles that we play both in our personal and professional worlds into a place where it's not necessarily catered to, but it's comforted and it's understood. And that looks different depending on where you are. So pre-pandemic, maybe you tolerated some things, but I will tell you, women have almost reset their tolerance levels and it looks a little bit different than it did maybe two or three years ago after everything that we're continuing to experience as it relates to the demands on the job, but also outside of the job. So the one thing I'll quickly share too in this same vein, um, to the, to the other points that, that the others made is taking control of the leadership disparities that exist. There is an expansion of acceptance of remote work, not that it's preferred, but it surely does offer opportunities for women that want to take on leadership roles um, where maybe they're not currently in their city. So maybe you're based in Chicago, but there's an opportunity based in DC where they will allow you to be an executive director and or in a leadership position where you truly can expand your reach, especially for single moms who in the past may have said, no, I can't look at that opportunity because I can't move. I have a child in high school that'll hate me if I take them out of, you know, before they graduate from high school. Um, but now you really do have the flexibility um, and the regional at least scale and scope to look at jobs in a completely different way. So I just wanted to offer that too, as women also think about how do you transform how you show up in the leadership prospects that you may have across the country. Mm. And I mean, you saw that you may have seen the chat just go and please continue to engage with each other in the chat. I hope you all are, are getting as many gems out of this as I am. Um, Cause I think what Tierra said about the fulfillment um, and the, instead of, we often say work-life balance, right? And we actually just hosted immersion weekend with our incoming class of scholars. And we had the same conversation and the idea is not balance anymore, right? It's how do we integrate every aspect of our life so that, yeah, occasionally I may need a little bit more personal time, but then I may need a little bit more work time, right? How do we make sure that it's constantly in this sort of um, ebb and flow so that there's fulfillment on all ends? Um, so I want to I want to shift a little bit into a conversation that's related to returning to the office um, and affects all women um, and all people. It, it affects everyone um, and it's microaggressions. And just for context, the term is um, commonplace for any daily ver verbal, behavioral, or environmental slights. So these are again micro moments um, that are either intentional or unintentional and. Um, may communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative attitudes towards stigmatized or culturally marginalized groups. So again, subtle, yes, thank you, Emily. I was trying to remember the acronym, subtle acts of exclusion um, is a really great um, um, framing for it from Inquest, which is a company um, that does diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. And they, they reframed it as subtle acts of exclusion, right? So we're not inclusive with our language or with our behaviors or things like that. And, and so I want to ask, how can women prepare to combat these things as they go back into the office? You know, it's everything from questions about our bodies to questions about our work or our abilities or anything like that. How can women um, really um, combat those. And I'll start with Tiara, and then I'd love to hear from, from everyone um, about this. Yeah, I think one, one thought that I had about bias too is realizing if it's from a person or is it, is, is it a culture? Is it an environment that you're working within? I think it shows up in different ways. Um, again, kind of going back to that tolerance comment, I think if it's a person, it's really important to lead with curiosity um, in terms of getting to the root of where that could be stemming from. Sometimes I will say that we're triggered, potentially women, we get triggered and it may be personal and it may not actually be aggressive. It may just be something that you're triggered by for any particular reason. Um, so as it relates to microaggressions, I would surely 
encourage women especially to really get to the root and ask questions if someone is coming towards you with a thought. Um, as we think about um, women and hair, particularly Black women, um, a lot of thoughts and comments have come out more recently around the acceptance of that, where maybe in the past you've gotten questions around hairstyles and or how you present yourself in professional capacities. Um, so my thought really is around just how you actually um, not confront, but really curiously, I guess, in a way, think through how you can have someone see, I guess, their thoughts or for lack of, I guess, concern or consideration for your differences in a new, in a new way. Um, by maybe asking questions in terms of why they particularly think that way or feel that way towards you. But I th do think the distinction is, is the environment allowing um, certain microaggressions to occur? Is it leadership? Where is it stemming from? And to think back to your values and how you would like to show up in those spaces. So do you want to be a part of a culture um, that doesn't address uh, hostile communication towards you in particular? Or is it a particular individual that you need to maybe pull to the side to kind of see where their thoughts or maybe microaggressions are stemming from? Yeah, I I, I think that that's true. Um, I mean, I I'm I don't know if it's a Scorpio or the Congolese in me, but I don't I I I'll actually like confronting. Confronting does not need to be hostile, right? It can just be like you were saying, Tara. You know, um, curiosity. Um, but what also I, that needs to be weighed against that is like, you know, what if that, what if that person now is only thinking that only you will call them out or engage in a curiosity conversation, right? Um, then it, it's, it's an extra weight of you on you, right? As, as, as having to be the, the sole source of kind of checking them or having them do some self-analysis on, on why they're saying these things. And, you know, and I really, I don't like the term microaggressions because there's nothing micro about these things, right? These are like cuts. I usually talk about them in, in terms of like death by a, by a thousand cuts because every single one has an impact on the, on the person receiving them. So I really think, you know, um, it has to be, and again, because especially if one person engages in them and even after that has been brought to their attention, let's say they, they engage in it again, then you're basically signaling, or, or that person may think, oh, it's okay, and, and may signal to others that it's okay. Now, now we are crossing into the culture issue, right? And so I think while you, anybody has obviously the purview to address that with that person directly, um, there has to be an institutional level or, or saying that basically says, these things don't fly. Yes, that may not necessarily be a viral thing. You know, it's not a compliance issue right now. It is just a microaggression right now. But as leadership, as an institution, you have to understand that these slights have serious impacts, especially if lived day after day after day by your, by your staff. And if that goes unaddressed by you, be that by a code of conduct or whatever that may be, then you're basically signaling, you know, it's basically letting a kid eat cookies before dinner day after day after day. And then the one time where you say, nope, you can't do it. They're like, well, what? You know, all this time I've been doing it you haven't said it. So I have a 10 year old, so I'm sorry that I'm using a <laughs> child reference here. But, but there has to be from the get-go from, you know, and I tell my clients, you know, from recruiting, that has to be clear until you onboard them again, you know, not just your annual, you know, sexual harassment and, and other type of things. That has to be a refrain that is very clear from minute one when that person as a prospective employee has contact with your with your with your organization so that they don't think or they will at least we hope think twice before they you know uh, engage in any type of you know verbal or other behavior that um, could be uh, you know uh, felt um, like a microaggression as well and Carla that actually sets us up really nicely for Linda yeah if you want to share I mean how can companies make sure that they are marketing the return to the office so that we can avoid these things. Um, yeah. yeah. So before, before I get to that question, Ella, I just wanted to jump in with what I think is a really handy resource for folks. It's a Harvard Business Review article from 2020, and it provides a framework for when and how to deal with microaggressions. So if the audience is interested in that and they, they take, they talk about discern, disarm, defy, and decide. 
And um, so folks might want to take a look at that. So of course, so much of microaggressions could be, you know, it depends on the context, right? The power, is there power dynamics at play? Is this an oops moment? Is, a, is it a pattern? What is the nature of your relationship with that person? So on and so forth. So um, I would uh, tell folks to check, check out that article um, as well. So, um, but getting to your question, Ella, um, I think in terms of companies, I don't think there's a one size approach that's, uh, you know, one size fits all approach that's going to work. Um, and, you know, some of the my fellow panelists have uh, touched upon this before, but I think you have to take into account different circumstances. So, you know, going back to caretaking a woman who is a single mom or a person who's taking care of an elderly parent is going to have different needs, right, than a two-parent household. Um, and, you know, some women are at the intersection of a pandemic, but also, and I'll steal this line from an article I read, a racism pandemic as well. So I think sometimes, you know, we have a tendency to just say women this or men that, um, but th these are not homogeneous groups, right? And so, um, so that's on an individual basis, but I think it has to be married with addressing more structural and systemic issues. So um, what I don't want is just to tell women, oh, just to lean in more, you know, um, you know, there's a reason why we have imposter syndrome. It's there's nothing inherently in women that <laughs> question themselves. It's because of these structural issues, right? And so um, I think there has to be you know, a change in the discourse. And again, I think less of the lean in, you know, be confident, get, you know, feel empowered, take control of the workforce, that that's all good. But, it, you know, you have to have the other side of it, right? I mean, the employers, the companies, the institutions really that are undergird our society have to support that. Um, otherwise, you could lean in all you want. <laughs> and it's yeah. not, you know, it's not going to do any good. So and Lord, is like, yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Super quick. Uh, this is my personal philosophy, but I've also seen it, especially in the place where I work at right now. Uh, it's kindness. Reward folks when they show kindness to each other. Take the extra five minutes when you're going to start a project, when you're going to invite someone to a meeting, when you're going to send a Slack message. And think about your audience. Are you starting with an 8 a.m. meeting knowing that the majority of the folks who will be joining are caregivers? Could you move that meeting later? And I think if you start doing that, others will follow. And then if organizations start recognizing those, I call it behaviors of inclusion, mm. will go, the impact is, is phenomenal. It's contagious. Mm. I love that behaviors of inclusion against the subtle acts of exclusion, right? So we've got, we've got sort of that dynamic going on. Um, I want to pivot for a little bit and then we'll go into Q and a just to hear and pivot is the word I used in on purpose because we have two people who have pivoted and, and we want to hear how can people use this moment to pivot in their careers and get closer to their purpose and more joyful work. And so Tierra, I'll ask you um, to go first and then we'll hear from Nicole um, as well. Yeah, so I'll just quickly share. Um, I think pausing is underrated, right? Like we're so busy, we're constantly juggling. You really can't even hear yeah. your thoughts without pausing to see what's happening inside and outside. Um, so it's usually inside out, right? Like we're usually out, 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 but we really need to kind of think and reflect in to really, again, kind of get back to that alignment that I spoke about earlier, yeah. which you're never really like ready enough, it seems, to make a move because there's always other things happening around you. So um, as you mentioned during the pandemic, I did make a move, a career move um, to get closer to the alignment that has been tugging at me for years, right? So having more multiple hats and serving my community, but also working in healthcare for a number of years and executive recruitment, really trying to get closer to how do I feed the energy that I get when I'm serving others, but also bring that into the business impact that I would like to have. Um, so kind of bringing my work together in one place allowed me to do so. Again, hesitantly, when you think about all of the uncertainty that surrounded the pandemic, but what I really nailed down was that we're always living in uncertainty, right? It's just yeah. moments in time. So there's a level of urgency um, that people have at different points in time based on what they experience. So as you think about different ways that you would like to pivot either in your career or in life, one of the things I would offer in terms of tangible things to take away 
is think about what skills you would like to develop. It doesn't necessarily have to be married to professional skills, but what can you own? Um, you're obviously in the driver's seat of where your development will lead you. So that could be online courses that you take, conversations that you have to feed some of your interest and your passion. It could also mean, again, contributing in different ways. Maybe if you're not fulfilled in your job, maybe you can contribute in service, or you could also write and contribute some thought leadership to your field and expand your thinking. So I would also really think about the skills you would like to develop outside of a title. I think someone mentioned a title earlier. I think it's beyond that. If you were to pivot into a new organization, think about the skills that you would develop, not what you'll be learning, but also who you'll be learning from. Mm. So think about the hiring process as it relates to hiring. You're typically talking to people that you're not gonna work with anyway. You may be reporting to them, but think about the colleagues that you'll be surrounded by. Do your research, not just on the company, but on the team and on the people that you'll actually be learning from to fulfill you and to get that development that you're seeking. Um, so I can relate to that just given the pivot that I made. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And Nicole, if you want to share. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, and I love everything that Tierra said. And, and, and I will offer first, when we think about this pivot, we have to believe that we deserve exactly what we want. Sometimes it's a challenge for us to recognize that we deserve exactly what we want. But what it takes is for us to create intention and the willingness to move outside of our comfort zone to get it. I think part of the challenge, especially for women, is that because we are trying to juggle so many things, the, the point that Tierra made about taking a pause is so spot on. The challenge is that we don't have clarity in terms of what we really want. And then we've got to figure out how to create the courage to be able to pursue it. So I wanna invite you all to stop letting the excuse of I don't have time get in the way of what it is that you really want, because that's what it is. It, it, it's really an excuse. More likely, we just don't know what we want. And so the discomfort of that causes us to not wanna get started. The fear of getting outside of our comfort zone into the unknown, it holds us back. But I don't have time really is just an excuse. So we need to get clear on our values. And again, the impact that we wanna have and then we've got to actively pursue it, leveraging our network, building a strategy to get what we want, Tierra's ideas in terms of identifying the skills that we need to create, expanding our network in a strategic way. Those are all tactical and practical things that we can do to think about moving forward from a pivot perspective. And so at Loyola, we created a program last year called Purposeful Careers Initiatives to help leaders do exactly that, right? Gain clarity, create, implement the strategy, navigate barriers, which spoiler alert, guys, they're mostly within ourselves, or I should say ladies, they're mostly within ourselves. The barriers that we have to overcome are usually the ones that, that we are, are, are creating for ourselves. And yeah. so I leave you with this comment. The desire to change is tugging at you for a reason, and it's because you were meant for more. We just have to honor the call to action. I think, Nicole, you said it perfectly, and we wouldn't be Baumhart or Loyola or Quinlan without offering you all tools um, to help you think about these things. And so if you are interested, of course, you can go ahead and apply. The link is in the chat. Um, but I think Nicole, Nicole leads that program for us. So if you're itching to, I know we have very limited time with all of our panelists, but if you're itching for more time with Nicole or anyone, um, definitely consider PCI um, and reaching out to folks after this. So we're gonna go into q and I do know we have a couple, we may have people who have to jump off um, uh, a little bit before one o'clock, but um, we really thank you all for joining us um, with us. So if we have, I know we had one question and it was earlier, so I'll, I'll start with that one, which was, how do we empower women to say enough um, as, they, as they think about that, right? Um, that was one of the questions that we had in the chat. And as I mentioned, feel free to direct message me. I can read it um, anonymously on behalf, or um, if you'd like to raise your hand um, and ask directly, the speakers will probably have time for about two or three questions um, before we wrap up. So I don't know if you all have any thoughts on how we empower women to say enough is enough, I'm moving on. I think it's like twofold. Oh, sorry. No, please, Carla, please. Oh, 
I, I think, you know, to Nicole's point, and I, I love that she said it, you know, we have two legs. We, we can walk away from a table. We can walk away from negotiations. We can walk away from toxic uh, work environments. Um, you know, I always, if you really truly believe like this is that position is aligned with you, you want to stay in the, in the company. Yes, obviously, you know, you should voice, you know, what you need because, you know, close, close mouth don't get fed, right? Is, 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 a, is, a, is what they say. But I think oftentimes people are afraid to do that because like, well, now I'm going to have this bullseye on my back. Now, they, now I'm, going, I'm going to be the one not being promoted or, you know, maybe even let go on the, some certain uh, pretenses and so forth. But you know, like Nicole said, we should be okay then. If that's if that's what the ethos of that entity is and that organization is, then obviously that it's not a place for you. And so there is this, yes, individually, we should walk away from these opportunities, from these tables, from these seats, uh, you know, if these seats don't are not aligned with us. But I think what we also have seen, especially over this last year and a half is the call out and I love it. I mean, mm -hmm. you can go on Instagram and you know, one nurse there or one barista here or this you know, customer rep says something that's a microaggression all the way to something racially motivated. And I mean, people are quicker than the FBI out there. They know in only two hours where that person works and they call out not just that person, but the employer and saying, you have this type of staff or this type of culture you know, possibly what are you going to do about it? So I think, you know, in terms of, I think it was Tiara who said that our, the, the status quo of what is, what is um, allowed or tolerated has risen significantly. Um, where we are saying enough is enough. What, where we say, you know, as, they, as we say here, what we're not going to do going forward is <laughs> accept these, these truths because they're not truths, right? They're constructs. So yes, there is the individual action of rejecting a job, rejecting an offer, whatever that, that may be, but collectively, we ought to now say, okay, well, this is what we expect from employers going forward. This is what needs to be done in terms of retaining women, uh, staff that, that, that identifies uh, as, as women, that identify as whatever the identity is, and, you know, really understanding what intersectionality looks like in the workplace. And then asking yourself as an organization, are we able, are we even fit to attract a person like that, to retain a person like that. You know, it's, it's, it's no longer the employer saying, what can you do for us? It's really saying, employee, this is what we can offer you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I really love, you know, both Tiara's and, and, and Nicole's comments around that. So I think that's, it has to be that combination of individual action, but also collective momentum and voice. Yeah. Nicole, I know you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Ella. I, I was just gonna offer too the, the 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 way that I think that we can both men and women can empower other women to be able to say enough is that we have to help the woman see herself for what she truly is, her gifts, her talents, her strengths, because it's that type of recognition of who we are that gives us the courage to be able to say enough, to be able to stand up at work and say, I'm not gonna take it anymore, or I'm looking for this type of change or whatever the, advoca the advocacy that we need to have on behalf of, our, of, of ourselves. The challenge is, is that we get in this mindset sometimes of, oh, I don't wanna rock the boat. Oh, I should be grateful for this job. Other people don't have it. And we, and we, we settle into this, this notion that allows us to not be brave. And so if we can see each other, if we can affirm one another, the men can affirm us, other women can affirm us. It gives us, I think, the courage to be able to stand on our own two feet in a very powerful and meaningful way and say enough. Love that. Love that. Absolutely love that. And um, Carla did have to, to run, but, and I wish we had, I mean, this could have gone on for hours. I wish we had um, definitely more time with each of you. I see a question. I see two questions and I'm going to kind of combine them. So one is, is sort of the one aspect of it is what are some thoughts on policies that can encourage um, or that we should avoid when it comes to creating inclusive environments for everyone at work? Um, and sort of the second portion, and I can sort of, I'll follow up with this again, but how do you prepare um, leaders of any level to help make those 
decisions, right? So how do we create an inclusive um, work and, and one person is a head of people at the organization? And then how do we, um, how do we make sure that we can prepare the leaders to do that um, from all, all aspects? So if anybody wants to, to jump in on that one. Well, yeah, Lourdes, I feel like that's you, yeah. An initiative we have right now, which is not so much about the technical skills, it's the, which I don't like when we call them the soft skills. They're actually the hard skills. Uh, so thank you, David, for, for that. It's what you reinforce, what you recognize for leaders, but also how you give them the opportunity to develop trust, transparency, and empathy. I think empathy is going to be the key element moving mm -hmm. forward. Are you listening more than you talk? Are you taking action and follow through, following through on your commitment? So I think it's, it's a new way of rethinking you as a leader. You're more a coach to the employees who work with you so you can make them successful and achieve the fulfillment that Tiara talked about. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just add too that I think that what companies should consider is that as they're making these, these, these decisions and, and, and committing to not having business as usual is really in these leadership discussions asking ourselves, what's our do different? really just kind of creating that as part of our operating rhythms to say, what is our do different? How do we look at this, this opportunity, the way we sell our products and services, the way that we lead, the way that we lead our culture, what's the do different that's going to get us to move to where we want to be versus where we are now? Yeah, Linda or Tiara, did you want to add anything? I'll just quickly add just the power dynamics, right, of decision-making. Give up some of the decision-making power and make it a collective effort as it relates to big swooping organizational change that people feel like they were heard and that their thoughts were measured in whatever huge transformation, for better or worse, even for positive change, some people need to be brought along um, so that everyone feels like it was a collective effort and it's a collective implementation. And sometimes I think leaders keep things stuck at the top and trickle down into what they think employees need, but they really do wanna feel brought along. Yeah. And I think that's the the perfect note to sort of wrap up on, right? Which is, which is everyone wants to be included. And we see that in the numbers that Linda presented in her presentation, right? We want to make sure that we're inclusive of all aspects. And, it, you know, we had the future of work um, for women, but this really was a conversation for all because we all do this work together. Um, and we all need to know when it's when it's time to say enough in our positions. We all need to know when to pause and reflect on what we wanna do next. We need to have empathy and kindness for all in our teams. Um, and we need to think about how we're gonna get fulfillment out of our lives. Because if anything, the pandemic has taught us that yes, work will be fulfilling, but it's not the only aspect of our lives. And so we wanna make sure that we have fulfilling work in addition to fulfilling lives, in addition to um, having just a really great experience while we're here. Um, so I, I really thank all of you. Linda, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and the articles. Um, Linda's a great resource um, for these types of things. So I hope you all reach out to her. Lourdes as well, Carla, Tierra, Nicole, as we mentioned, PCI um, is open um, if you all are interested. And um, I just, I wish we had more time, um, but we, um, we're so glad to have you all joining us here today. And thank you to everyone that joined. As I mentioned, the recording will be available. Um, afterwards, we'll send it to everybody who registered. Um, and yeah, thank you all. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.